we, we were like locked in a room and he's screaming at me and he's got his friends screaming at me and they were making stuff up. And I thought he might kill us as well. I, I was actually sure of it. So I thought he was going to kill me out in the middle of nowhere. It was after midnight in the suburbs of Buenos Aires. Like no one knew where we were. Like anything could have happened to us. He had his whole like mass of thousands of people outside who would have done whatever he wanted to us. Hello, lovely people. Welcome back to my channel and welcome to the live stream. Lovely patrons, I am joined today by the fabulous Andrew Gold, host of the podcast and YouTube channel On The Edge with Andrew Gold. Very bingeable content, if I uh, may say so. So, Andrew, would you mind telling us a little bit about yourself? Mm, I would love to, yeah, and thanks for having me on. Um, I'm a journalist and a linguist. Uh, I, I love being a linguist more, but I don't do so much in my, in my work with that stuff, but I, I speak five languages. I lived around the world documenting different kinds of weird, fringe, strange people, often with a religious element, so exposing an exorcist or, or, or hanging out with people who believe in UFOs and things like that, uh, and using the languages to be able to do that in all sorts of places. And yeah, and now I have a YouTube channel, as you say, and I uh, do similar things there and some sensationalist stuff there as well. How did you become, because you've been doing this for kind of a while now uh, in your other work as well in the past, how did you get interested in skeptic stuff, kind of culty, weird beliefs, esoteric sort of stuff? I think it probably, I've, I've, I've wondered this a lot. I think a lot of it started when I was um, young and I, was, I grew up in a Jewish mm -hmm. secular family, but even in the secular families, you still typically go to Hebrew school on Sundays because everyone's preparing for their bar mitzvah or bat mitzvah. Um, so I was learning Hebrew and stuff like that. And I was just listening to these uh, extraordinary tales about Jonah and the whale and all these kinds of things. And they just struck me as fiction right away when I was like five. I was, it's get croaky. But so, yeah, um, <laughs> like I've got Jonah in the... No, I don't know what that even means. Sorry. <laughs> so, um, but I started to notice that my uh, fellow you know, pupils or whatever, took these stories and even the teachers took them at face value. And I just remember being sort of flabbergasted quite young. So part of it was to do with that. And I, I started wanting to look into what it is that makes them believe things. And then what things do I believe that are obviously wrong and mad and magical thinking and I don't even know about. And that really fascinates me as well. And then there's also something I think to do with hierarchies and respect, which got me looking into things like uh, cults in particular. Uh, I always remember being in, in a synagogue and I was talking or something and some kids my age sort of turned around to police me and they were like, shush, the rabbi's talking, show some respect. And that really, again, it struck me, well, not, not, that really struck me, struck me as like, why? And I was young, I must have been 11 or 12 or 13 maybe. And I was like, why respect this person? And there's, there's two kinds of respect, I think. There's that kind of respect of like, treat people how you want to be treated. And I think everyone should respect each other like that. But there's also a kind of respect that I think is sort of reverence. And I don't like reverence. I don't like anyone to revere me. And I don't want to revere them. Uh, I'm almost like a, a, a communist in that sense. But I'm not I'm not a communist, um, you know, fi financially or whatever. But, uh, you know, I want everyone on equal footing. And some guy wearing like some weird garb, some medieval garb, that's not, you know, that doesn't impress me. So I think it was part of that, part of rebelling against that kind of hierarchical structure. So forgive me if this is a little broad or a bit unfair, but I'm interested to know, is there a particular cult or religious group or something that you've encountered that you consider more sort of dangerous today that more people should be aware of? Mm. So, I mean, look, the, fir the first one to, to talk about would probably be Scientology. And I think Scientology is on the wane and they are less dangerous than they were. So in terms of a huge group, but uh, they're one of the last big ones. I think the internet's had a big effect on these kinds of cults and you can just get all the information there. Still, You still see people sort of go in and, you know, hidden undercover filming, of, which I haven't done because I'm scared to do it. But you still see people going in and they ask these questions. Should I look up on the internet? Um, and they're always like, no, no, you should never do that, you know. Because cults, of course, they thrive on secrecy um, and the internet sort of ruined that a little bit. But it only works if there's secrecy. And that's one of the differences between cults and religions, I think, is that with a cult, uh, tends, they don't tend to tell you everything. A religion, it's like if you want to learn about the Bible or the Quran or the Torah, it's mostly there and it's free or it's freely available for whoever seems to want it. The cult, so if you look at someone like Scientology or Nixium's another one, which was a sort of a religious uh, uh, cult because they didn't have that kind of uh, folklore, um, 
there's loads of hidden stuff. And the idea is the more you pay and the more you put in and the more you work for these organizations, the more you will be let in on. So Scientology, the whole way that it's been working is, um, you know, they call them the OTE levels or whatever. The OTE, the OTE, level, OTE is my podcast name on the edge, uh, but OT levels uh, and one to like nine, I think it is. And the more levels you get, the more information you get. But the thing is, you can now just find that on online. A friend recently said that he thinks the Moonies, the Unification Church, is more dangerous. It's more widespread, has its sort of uh, tentacles or whatever spread everywhere. So the Moonies is quite a dangerous one. And then some people, I suppose, would answer the question about the dangerous ones as we move into a, a, a less religious in the traditional sense world they would probably look at the political ones. Uh, and that's when you get into sort of the Trump stuff and the QAnon stuff. Um, and I think there might be stuff on the left as well. So I think I think politically is probably where that's going to happen. Even as the religions die out, we'll, we'll get more politically cultish. I think that's really interesting as well because um, when we've been, I mean, we had the census recently and we've been looking at uh, a, a decline in religion in general, especially here with the Church of England, stuff like that. But it's not equating to a decline in uh, sort of irrational, fantastical thinking, conspiracies, if anything, are sort of on the rise and taking over there. So that's it's interesting that that kind of thinking has sort of just been displaced yeah. into other things. Yeah, I, I think I think yeah. one of the the reasons that I was never into conspiracy theories at all. Uh, again, goes probably back to my Jewish upbringing because uh, anyone who's really into conspiracy theories will know, like, at the end of them, underlying them um, is Judaism. It's all, you know, not the religion as such, but Jews. So the idea is that the Jews did it. Mm. And you hear that enough times growing up that whenever you hear like the slightest bit of, oh, is there is this a conspiracy theory? So I've interviewed people and they start talking about the Great Reset or whatever. So that's one of the conspiracies going around at the moment. But it's not just a conspiracy theory. It is a real thing. It's the World Economic Forum. The conspiracy is about you know how much you believe them and their plans to change the world after COVID. That's where the conspiracy lies. But it is a real thing. But even hearing something like the Great Reset to, to secular Jewish ears is like, oh, what's this going to be? When am I going to hear like, a Stein or a Berg or a, a Rosen or someone like that involved. So, and, and then it was interesting to, if you think about like some of the big uh, conspiracy debunkers, they tend to be Jewish as well. You got like Michael Shermer. I found myself time and time again talking to these people and it's like, you're, you're Jewish, aren't you? And, and they're like, yeah. And I found that that tends to be like a big motivator in debunking um, conspiracy. But yeah, I agree. That's one of the places where I think the irrational mind and our, our, our need for the irrational uh, still exists today. It has interested me as an adult looking at conspiracy theories and, and the kind of stuff that I believed when, because when I was a kid, the person who taught me my conspiracy theories was at the time like a raging lefty socialist. And I never heard a word of any of the, the, the core. Th I mean, we would watch David Icke yeah. and, you know, like the Jewish lizard people conspiracy is at the heart of what he believes. But it just it never touched me because it went sort of unsaid. As an adult, it's like, oh, that is centre to all conspiracy somehow. <laughs> like, it, I, you know, it's it started, I guess, um, in the Middle Ages. I think, or it probably started before that. The idea that the Jews killed Jesus, um, and then you go into the Middle Middle Ages. It was like the Jews um, were able to lend money, uh, and the, uh, Christians weren't able to do that. It's neither a borrower nor a lender or whatever. So for whatever reason, and, and also the Jews were allowed to do that and, and I think it, I, I think I'm right in saying they had to do that they were like forced by law that was like the one thing they were allowed to do so that's where a lot of the thing with Jews and money came from as well um, and and that's also probably this the first thing that people say about sort of uh, a rival you know because there's also like the Scottish oh the Scottish are cheap and the Irish are cheap and the French will say the Belgians are cheap you know it's just any sort of rival the first thing you say is about money because money makes the world go round I know it's a bit of a cliche but it does and it means that if if, you, if to you your world has stopped moving around or if you're not able to get money or whatever your your world stops and then if you believe that this one group of people are taking your money or doing something with your money then you know you you're going to not like those people and i i have sympathy with um <laughs> i suppose i have sympathy with racists because i i'm of the belief and i think i might be proven wrong i might come round on this idea but i'm i personally am of the belief that people think that they are doing good. I don't think there are many people in the world who uh, sit around going like, you know, oh God, I have evil beliefs, beliefs, aren't I great? I think most people 
need to think of themselves as good people. So if we go back to 1930s Germany, I mean, it was the whole country, and they thought that expelling the Jews was a good thing. Uh, and I've tried to go into all my looking into cults and religions and things with that ethos, because I, I think we're so quick to sort of blame people who disagree with us and say they must either be really stupid or really evil and deceptive. And that's just not what those people think of themselves at all. And they think it of us. So I think we can only get out of this muddle of misunderstandings and things by open and clear communication. Uh, although it's very complicated when you do find yourself sitting down with like a really, you know, far right uh, Nazi who hates you for your existence. But that hatred still comes from fear. They, they, they're scared. So I try to understand it, you know. I think that's I think that's the only way and I do I have found when I've looked into a lot of conspiracies there tends to be some kind of kernel of sympathetic justifiable you know um you know a community might have been hurt by a government in the past in a way that's made them wary or something like that and uh, it, it does help understand since we're on the topic I'd love to ask you because you're uh you're a, you conduct a lot of interviews you uh, do them very well. You've also got a couple of uh, videos on your channel where you break down uh, some interviews. You got the I, I watched the other day the famous uh, Tom Cruise on Matt Lauer, and you broke that down. I thought that was really interesting. I'd love to know if you've got any good tips, not just for conducting interviews, but maybe for speaking in general uh, to people who might have very different beliefs or might be wary of our questions. I think it's it's hard, and I very rarely interview like the other side you know because on a podcast that's just a really difficult thing to do so my documentary mm -hmm. on exorcism was me for, for for listeners who or viewers who know of louis theroux who louis theroux is british people will at least um but john ronson's another one or michael moore in the states it's this sort of history of documentary making stacy dooley's another one she's great uh and you go in sort of gonzo style and you go and meet the person and it's a very different thing because you're basically saying uh, to this person you want to interview, you're saying like, hey, I'm going to come in and bed myself with you for a few days and see what you do. And there's no sort of promise or guarantee uh, about how you're going to come out of that. When you are podcasting and you're like an independent journalist, you don't have the BBC like setting it all up for you and talking and doing all that stuff. You have to then email someone uh, who's potentially in a cult or something like that and say, hey, I'd love to speak to you. And you can't say in the email, and I'm going to exploit you and make you look bad and show you up for having bad beliefs, or I'm going to convert you or anything like that. So you would have to be a little bit sneaky just to get them on. And then you end up in a difficult, awkward conversation. And is that pleasant for people who are on a, you know, if it's a podcast, they're jogging around a park or they're on a nice walk and they're hearing like an awkward phone call in their ears where someone's going to hang up potentially. So it's something I gave a lot of thought to and it's not something I'm against doing, but I've very rarely done it in podcasting form, maybe one or two conversations with flat earthers, for example. But even then I try and be very understanding of them. Uh, I don't think you're going to be able to talk them around in one online converse conversation. When it was like this exorcist guy, I guess I didn't have to talk him around because we just hung around with him and we saw that he was being abusive with his staff he was taking advantage of young women that he was exercising uh, and that kind of thing so I just was calm at all times the the essence of the answer here though is is um n not being judgmental I think and and what we were just saying before of understanding that other people uh, don't think of themselves as bad um, I like this thing that the writer Will Storr was saying the other week I saw he was just saying like I I know, I, I feel very strongly that I'm right about pretty much everything I believe because I wouldn't believe those things otherwise, right? It's like a, why would you believe something unless you were pretty sure that you're right about it? That, that makes sense. But you also know that it's incredibly unlikely, probably impossible that you're right about everything. So you must be wrong about some things. But I, I challenge the listeners, viewers, me and you to even be able to identify, well, what am I wrong about? It doesn't feel like I'm wrong. So I think it's just going into every conversation with that mind. And I remember speaking to a guy called Jesse Morton, who passed away last year. We don't, no one seems to know why or how, but he was a former terrorist who um, helped do the, <coughs> the ingredients for the Boston Marathon bomb. Um, and so he sort of did all that and he went to prison and then he repented and he felt terrible and he joined the other side and he talked people down. He became like an ex a person who talks down extremists. And he always said the same thing, like it, it helps if you have been where they are 
that's a huge you're already you've already done half the battle if you're someone who comes in like some guy who's never been on that extremist side they're just unlikely to listen to you so for him it was always about finding mm-hmm. common ground uh, and, and and showing that person that you don't think that they are uh, a monster for holding their beliefs because you did as well and you've held your own bad beliefs and then you can have a conversation so it's it's a complicated one i think since you brought up uh, the Exorcism documentary, which is fantastic, by the way, if anyone's watching and hasn't seen it, uh, I believe it's called Exorcism, The Battle for Young Minds. It's really great. It is very, it's very Louis Theroux. I've got to ask you some questions about it. I even made my mum watch it oh. when uh, <laughs> I was up for my Christmas holiday. <laughs> so in that documentary, it's it's quite a strange one because of, you know, you were talking about sort of implanting yourself into this person's kind of daily life the exorcist that you're following becomes quite wary of you and very distant how did that feel sort of as somebody trying to report on him being shut out and how did you kind of deal with that in the moment um it was really difficult actually i'm I'm pleased you touch on that because i think when people are watching a documentary you don't really think about that stuff so much i'm somebody who i think um has had to and I guess a lot of us are like this. I'm sure a lot of people can relate hearing this, but I've had to, I was too concerned about people liking me. And I suppose, you know, we become YouTubers and podcasters and things that's still in us. Everybody else has moved on with their lives and we're still like, here I am on video, everybody, click the like button. Uh, It's very hard to move away from that. You want people to like you. You also want to be nice to people. You want people to be happy around you. And that made it very difficult hanging around this guy who I just thought was abhorrent. and again, I tried to understand and he's from a different background to me and he has different beliefs to me. If he was a true believer, he might just be a psychopath who was taking advantage of people. Um, but yeah, as we were, as, as you point out, as we were there over the weeks, he started to catch catch wind of my questions. My questions were supposed to be, I guess they were a little bit ironic and cheeky because I wanted the viewer to understand things that maybe he didn't because the viewer would know that I find this ridiculous, a lot of the exorcism stuff. Um, And he didn't catch on at first. And I was asking him about vampires and uh, Leo Messi, the footballer, like, you know, I can't even remember what I asked about him, but just ridiculous questions. And he answered them very, very seriously. And to me, that was enough. It was like a way of taking him down with satire, which is a really traditional way of taking people down who who have abused their power. Uh, but at the same time, we're sitting around in his church and after a while I got the impression he didn't like me very much. Um, he was getting annoyed by me. He was trying to avoid me. And then me and my director, David Hayes, um, we just made it the two of us because the BBC weren't on board yet. We were living in Argentina. This is where the exorcist was. We were just like, felt like spare parts in this church. And we just thought we've got to try and get a big interview with him and actually ask him a few questions and actually, you know, really push him about things. I've done all the funny stuff at the beginning, but now I need to be really pushing him about the uh, ethics of what he was doing. Or And before that happened, before we were able to have that sort of interaction and clear the air or whatever, he just lost his temper with me and started screaming at me about some other stuff. And um, we, we lost that chance. So, it, you know, to answer your question, it was hard. It was really hard. And after this argument we had, I, I remember I went home, I was shaking for like days because I, I can't handle that kind of um, uh, conflict. So I found it very, very difficult, but but happy we did it because we, we got a good film out of it. It's sort of reassuring to hear that that impacted you because, of course, in the shiny documentary that we see, you you are so well put together and you really take everything on the chin. And I'm like, if it was me, I'd probably cry when he started shouting at me. So, uh, well, we, it's, we it's nice. yeah, I mean, there's like a, with people, when they watch it or whatever, they'll see there's a bit, as you say, we, we, we were like locked in a room and he's screaming at me and he's got his friends screaming at me and they were making stuff up. And that's, the, you know, when you're being shouted at and then you know something's not true. So there's the injustice of it. That feeling is horrible. And I thought he might kill us as well. I, I was actually sure of it. And I'm not used to, I'm not some like intrepid guy. I can't like deal with that kind of thing. So I thought he was going to kill me out in the middle of nowhere. It was after midnight in the suburbs of Buenos Aires. Like no one knew where we were. Like anything could have happened to us. He had his whole like um, mass of thousands of people outside who would have done whatever he wanted to us. So I really felt that way. Um, And we had to condense that shouting argument to one minute because that's all you get really for, you know, it's a 40 minute documentary, but we shot 20 hours. Um, so it's one minute, but there was, yeah, there was actually half an hour of me shouting very nervously back 
which we took out because as soon as you start putting that in, it's like you've got to follow the thread of my whole argument and his whole argument and it just wouldn't have worked. So it did end up, as you say, it looked a little bit more pristine and put together and produced, which again was a style I didn't really want, but BBC Three did at that time. So our initial cut was a bit more um, rough and ready than that. The old Louis Theroux style, you could see a, there's a camera and a microphone in the in the shot, that kind of thing. I really like that, but they wanted it like flashy, polished, quick. So that's how it was. But yeah, I, we got back in the end by the skin of our teeth and got in a taxi back to um, Buenos Aires, the center. It took like an hour. And I just, uh, yeah, I remember just walking in, like seeing my girlfriend. I was just like a wreck, just shaking and stuff. But also it's impossible to really explain that to a person who hasn't then seen the videos and stuff. So I think she was probably a bit taken aback and a bit like, you're right. Like, come on, it's just a little filming thing. And I was like, you don't know what I've seen. But, um, you know, it, 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 she saw eventually, of course. And uh, yeah, it's all pretty mad. He's a, a terrifying, <laughs> he's a terrifying man, even just watching the super clean cut. It's a, it's a scary thing. There's a couple of strange moments in that, and you can tell me if this is, uh, I don't want to break any codes of, you know, polite conduct or anything. So I don't care. You don't have anything. to answer this if you don't want to. Okay. <laughs> um, there's a couple of weird moments in that documentary where you encounter another reporter yeah. who's sort of woven into this story. And um, when you first kind of talked to him in the documentary, uh, he was there for this first famous ex exorcism and it transpires that he's been coming back regularly to visit the exorcy, the person who was exorcised. <laughs> exorcising? Um, I don't know. Exorcising? I'm not sure. We'll have to look that one up later. Um, yeah. And and so he, he keeps coming back and he's there again and he says he was, uh, it, it's made him closer to God, the experience. What What's your internal reaction to, to hearing that? from like a journalist it's, it's a hard one because uh, i guess one of the things i've tried to learn over the years is to not make assumptions about what people uh, actually think and their underlying motivations at the same time i guess i'm a hypocrite because i do a lot of the sensational stuff on youtube about what tom cruise was really thinking or Meghan markle or prince harry and all that and i try to use as much of like the actual words that they've written as possible and to say like you guys might disagree let me know because i love i love I love like debating. I love, you know, I, I love going into a room and me saying, I think Prince Harry might be a psychopath. And a friend of mine going like, what, what do you mean? He's a really nice guy. He's done all this charity and stuff. And I'm like, well, so did this. And like afterwards just being mates and it doesn't matter. We just have a different view of the thing. I love that. And it's not, there isn't enough of that these days. Anyway, I've, I digress. This guy, Marco, uh, he worked for a tabloid out there. So again, I don't want to make assumptions, but it was a tabloid that made a lot of money, it was, say, The Sun, or I don't know what the American equivalent would be. Um, but instead of like some of the titillation and gossipy stuff that we typically have, there's like big paranormal sections out there because that's a bit of a bigger deal out in South America. So this, this was, of course, Argentina. So whether he was a true believer or not, Marco, I know that he was profiting considerably from his relationship with the exorcist, Padre Manuel, because the exorcist was quite a big deal out there at the time. Um, and he had like, he became very close friends, Marco, the, the, the journalist did with The Exorcist. So he was going back and back all the time and then saying, you know, next week we're going to do, he would use the word we, the pronoun, rather than like uh, the priest is going to do this. It was we are going to do a, a, a multiple exorcism where we exercise 30 people at once and like, more and more sensationalist stuff that was good for his newspaper. So when I encountered him in the church, it's very possible that he saw me as a rival um, or something, or he thought this was a good way for him to gain further favor with the Padre. So we had a little chat, didn't really talk about very much. And then when I ended up being locked up in this room, he was in there with the Padre, the Padre saying to me, why have you told Marco that I kiss one of the exercises, let's say, uh, on the lips. And I was like, I never, ever said that. And I had secretly suspected that's what he was doing, but he went berserk, the, the priest, and the journalist was in there going, yeah, you did ask me that. And I was like, we literally have the footage of the video here. I can show you on the camera. But these are people who believe in the paranormal, which means they are less likely to trust, you know, things that we would consider proof. They have a very different way of uh, experiencing the world. And I don't know, part of me wants to be like, so we've got to respect that. And then part of me is like, what a bunch of idiots, you know, I've got the video here, I can show them the truth. And it was very, very frustrating. But I think it was, yeah, he wanted to sort of carry favor. It's a very, it's a very strange situation as, as well. Yeah, to, to watch it as a viewer, because <laughs> there's no cameras. It, it's just, you can just see 
the door of the room yeah. that you're locked in trying to defend yourself and yeah it's 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 very bizarre i can imagine that being quite stressful to have to deal with no it, it was and, and and i should say my my friend david who is the director he's brilliant he's so good and i want to make some more stuff with him but it's so hard to get a commission with for documentaries and stuff like that but he kept it running you know and, and i forgot that i had a microphone on my collar so that entire interaction um was me not realizing that i i didn't know that we were even recording it and then when we got in the taxi on the way home we thought we'd ruined the documentary because we were like, oh, it's over now. We've lost access to him. It's all over. So we were gutted, really, uh, you know, relieved to be alive, but, but gutted. Like we'd been working on this for weeks. This was going to be our big break because we hadn't made anything like this before. And then that mm. happened. And it was only as we started having this conversation in the car, like this hour long journey back, still both of us shaking with nerves, that we started saying to each other, like, hang on, like, you had your microphone on and your lapel the whole time and we've got that and I left the camera running so at least we've got the outside of the door uh maybe that makes the documentary better and you know that thing when you're sort of celebrating with a friend like yeah yeah oh we've got to check it as soon as we get home and we went through like hours and hours of stuff and we were like we've got it and we looked at each other because the thing was because we hadn't sold it to the BBC yet and that's almost unheard of just to you can't do that just go and make a documentary you and your friends and then, because they, they don't want to watch it, the commissioners there want to have been involved from the beginning because that's their job. They don't want to be told by a couple mm -hmm. of guys like, no, we just did it without you, even though you said no, and here's the finished product. So we had to badger them for like years to just watch it. And eventually they got sick of me just emailing and calling all the time. And they were like, oh, okay, I will watch it next week. And like a few weeks passed and I was like, have you watched it? Have you watched it? And eventually this guy was like, oh yeah, we did watch it. Like. What, what the hell? And I was like, I told you for two years, I told you. Because it was just this mad, we thought the mad thing was going to be the exorcisms. And that is mad, but it wouldn't have been enough. Because he screamed at us mm. like a lunatic. It's all, that's like almost unseen on TV. Or, you know, it's, it's such a rare moment. And it shows how much luck is involved in documentary making because we didn't know he was going to be a maniac like that in that moment. So in the end, it turned out to be the best thing um, that ever happened in my life, really, that, I, that he berated us in such a manner. Um, so what, what we thought was awful turned out to be good. And maybe that's a lesson for uh, how we should look at life. We've mentioned a little bit briefly Scientology. That's something that you've got quite a lot of. Again, I say it's very bingeable. You've got um, some fascinating vis um, uh, videos and interviews on. Uh, I love to just know what's the most, what's the most like shocking thing you've learned. Mm -hmm. Firstly, like bingeable is an interesting word, and you're right. And I, in a good, I hope you're right. Anyway, and this is something I've I've been learning as a as a YouTuber or, or whatever. And it's something I first learned. I guess my first ever job was at Harper Collins Book Publishers, and I remember like they had this. I can't remember what it was. I think it was Tolkien or some beautiful book was coming out, some sort of celebration of an old thing, and it and it did really well and like set some records. And I was like, oh, that's cool. And then a month later, they brought out this Justin Bieber photo book, and it like killed the Tolkien thing by like 50 times over and I was depressed <laughs> about it I know because I was 21 and I was I'd done a literature English literature degree so I was obviously a snob and I was really snobbish and I was saying to my boss like what's what is how can we do this like this isn't right we're, we're slaving away here like um, making these books and stuff trying to do really do whatever and change the world with our literature and this book of like Bieber on a motorbike is just like <laughs> killing it so uh, she said, like, you know, it was basically welcome to the real world, you know, but she was like, look, we make those Justin Bieber books so we can do the other more complicated, maybe beautiful, intricate stuff. And, you know, you, mm -hmm. want, you want there to be books for everyone. Well, not everyone likes reading the difficult stuff. Some people like the Bieber stuff and they still deserve to get nice books or whatever. And I, that sort of was a big learning curve for me. Uh, that I should be less of a snob. Um, so I started this podcast for two years. It was like every episode I wanted, and I was doing one a, one a week at first. It was mostly an audio podcast because it was all about audio. I wasn't going to be a YouTuber. You know, that was ridiculous. And the, 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 the idea was that I would find edgy, on the edge, you know, content. And it was going to be completely different and diverse every week. It was going to be stuff no one's seen, right? Uh, so an interview with a guy, I won't say the name because if you put this out on YouTube, it will ruin it. But one of those men who, who who has an attraction for younger people, right? Um, so, sorry for everyone, because because the advertising stuff, you can't you can't say the word of those people. Um, but like an interview of one of them, and then an interview of somebody who like killed their partner, uh, somebody in prison. I'm talking to, and then a cult, and then this and that. 
And like, that was great for my ego because it was like, I'm making the most diverse thing, but it was very difficult to make a YouTube channel because you've got to have a sort of niche. You've got to be able to like say, this is what my channel's about and so on. Anyway, that's a very long way of saying. I started making videos about Scientology and it just blew up. And I went from having mm. uh, like 1,000 subscribers on YouTube after two years of doing this uh, to like, it's now at like 73,000. That's only a few months on. Um, so it's like 15, 20,000 people a month are just coming along. And it started with uh, the Scientology stuff, particularly around Tom Cruise and particularly around Katie Holmes, anything to do with the two of them. And I was amazed at how interested people are. And also I thought, you know what, why have I got to be a snob or whatever? Like this is interesting. And the most interesting thing does revolve around Tom Cruise and his love life. And it just is interesting, even if it's tabloid and sensationalist. Because a lot of people know this already, so forgive me those of you who do, but those who don't, and this is amazing how many don't, Tom Cruise does appear to have done some really awful things. And the Katie Holmes thing, a lot of people now do know, but like she was, she was found by Scientology after this long search uh, for someone after Nicole Kidman to be Tom Cruise's wife. Um, they initially wanted somebody who was already a Scientologist. Katie Holmes wasn't. Uh, so the first person they found was somebody called Nazanin Bonyadi, who's an English actress uh, who was already in Scientology. So it made sense and she's very, very beautiful and all, you know, every ticked every box for Tom Cruise. So she didn't know about this, you know, it was top secret. She didn't know they were searching for this Tom Cruise girlfriend person. But she was uh, taken on these secret missions where they did what they call auditing, which is basically therapy sessions, but everything's written down. The point is it can later be used against you. But they say, we're finding everything about you. And they started pushing her and asking her about all her sexual desires and needs, everything Tom Cruise wanted to know, which is pretty outrageous. And then eventually she's just like dropped in a place and she's sort of waiting and Tom Cruise walks in and she's told that she is to be his girlfriend. And apparently, you know, I've heard from quite a few sources about this. Apparently she was quite uh, interested at first because not just on a um, romantic level, but if you're in Scientology and you're a true believer, it's there's nothing more exciting. There's no bigger moment than you get to be the partner of the most important person in Scientology's history, which is Tom Cruise. So they went out for a bit and then there were um, a couple of problems. Uh, one of them was that she, a Nazanin this is, found it difficult apparently to understand when the leader of Scientology, David Miscavige, spoke. Obviously he has uh, some American accent, but apparently doesn't speak that clearly. This is a really big deal in Scientology because Scientology is all about going clear. It's all about um, having clear communication. You have to be able to make yourself really well understood. Everybody looks you, when you interview ex-Scientologists, they still have a lot of these quirks, I suppose. They look you in the eye, if they were going to shake your hand, they would do so very hard and very with a lot of enthusiasm. And they say your name over and over. So I've got loads of friends now who are former Scientologists and they're all just like, so Andrew, Andrew, what you need to realize is Andrew, it's like constant. It's just a habit now, but very clear. So for the leader of Scientology and also the best man at Tom Cruise's uh, previous wedding, he's his best friend, uh, to not be understood by Nazanin was a huge, huge insult. The other insult was that she said to Tom Cruise, after Tom Cruise won an award for Scientology, some sort of stupid award, she said, very well done. And that is a very Scientology-ish phrase. They say, very well done. They, you say that quite a lot. But apparently, you don't say it to your superior. You say that to people on your level or beneath you because it's seen as patronizing. I suppose in the same way that if somebody says, oh, well done, you know, it is a bit patronizing. <laughs> in Scientology, it means even more. So that was the end of it for him. Like the fact that she'd said that, the fact that she couldn't understand his best friend who's the leader of Scientology. And he, I don't know if he, I don't know if he gave the orders for this, but it was like she was told it's over. And then she had to spend a lot of time cleaning bathrooms with toothbrushes and doing all sorts of horrible, horrible chores. Uh, just just awful until she was able to get out of there. And she's hardly spoken about it at all since, but there are articles you know, in, in quite reputable magazines about this. Um, and I think the fact that she hasn't spoken about it much means she must have signed some sort of uh, NDA or something like that, as many people who have left Scientology will have done. Katie Holmes, for example, never speaks about Scientology. Um, so, I mean, one of the people who tells us a lot of this stuff is Leah Remini, the actress from King of Queens, because uh, mm -hmm. she got out and she started talking about some of the awful stuff that goes on there. So that's the thing that's like 
not just gossipy and sensationalist, but like profoundly disturbing. If that's how she's being treated, how are other people who are beneath her and who aren't, you know, close with Tom Cruise or whatever being treated? Some of the way that the people are treated is mad. I mean, Mike Rinder was one of the top guys in Scientology. He's, he left. Mike talks about David Miscavige again, who's apparently very um, diminutive in, in sort of stature. He's like five foot two or something, but he just goes around punching people in face in the face. He'll just do it if he's in a bad mood. So he punched Mike like a few times just fist just punch him in the face and no one can do anything because he's the leader so he's really um quite quite a piece of work by all accounts so that's my little summary of scientology speaking of weird ones while i've got you um the last series i'm just here to to pick your brain about all your great content to be honest i love it, um, <laughs> love it. you've got <laughs> you've got this amazing series um psych psychopathy or psychopathy i don't know how hmm. to pronounce it yeah, um, or the edge which is where you interview some people with psychopathic disor disorders and stuff like that what's kind of i find them very um i mean this relates to how you've talked about interviewing and stuff so far but i find them very sort of open and thoughtful and quite compassionate what's um would you say has surprised you the most about doing those kind of interviews i think what surprised me is probably how much i've enjoyed talking to those people i i, I think obviously we have this stereotype of psychopaths um, going around killing people and obviously some of them do i would think it's in the very very small minority i think it's thought that one to three percent but more likely one percent of the population of men anyway are psychopathic just meaning they're devoid of empathy but it's no you know if you think of that uh, that in america that would be what three and a half million people there certainly aren't three and a half million murderers going around the vast majority are just normal people going about their day they just will all know someone like that and go god they don't seem to have much empathy some of them will just feel that they get on nicer in life by being nice to people and that's a selfish thing in its in itself being nice because people are nice back to you and you can get um you can get um status from that as well one of the reasons i, I so enjoy talking to psychopaths is because I'm a, I'm a strong believer in this theory again it's this guy will store i love i've loved this writer called will store and he's he's got a, a theory called the status game i'm sure it was like some scientist people thought of this but he popularized it by writing about it he's a journalist and the status game suggests that there are three main ways that humans get status and, and basically everything we do is about status in some way and one of them is dominance and typically you see that more in men than women but, but you see that in women as, as well, of course. You see that in all sorts of people. And, it, you know, evolutionarily speaking, if you're around a campfire or you're in a tribe and you're dominant, people will have to give you more of the food and the bounty and whatever else there might be. So that's one way of getting that kind of status. Uh, another is success. So again, if you were in this tribe and you invented a wheel and some fire, people would want to keep you around, keep you happy, keep you well fed. So that's another kind of status. Uh, but there most of us are not that successful uh, and not able to be that dominant. And the third, the th this is only a theory, by the way, because all of the evolutionary psychology stuff you have to take with a bit of a pinch of salt, but I just quite like this theory. Uh, the third type is status, uh, sorry, virtue. The third type of status is virtue. Um, because if you're nice and you're seen to be doing nice things, you'll also get some of the food and people will be nice to you in return. Um, and I, I don't know, I like, and, and I'm not one of these people running around going, because this has been part of the culture wars. I know I'm not part of the culture wars of like, oh, they're virtue signaling and they're being a toxic this and they're being, I, I'm not that interested in that stuff. Uh, but I do like that philosophy. I like the concept of like, okay, we, we are all, we're all selfish and we're in some way and we're all trying to get that status and that acclaim and for people to like us and to be nice to us. And we're going about it in slightly different ways. And the virtue one is a difficult one because you can't always tell, you know, it, it was important that people seemed virtuous to get the, enough food in the tribe, but they didn't have to be virtuous. They just had to seem it. And there are some bad actors out there. If you think about some of the worst people, there's a blonde person whose name I shouldn't even probably say, who was working at the BBC for a few decades, um, who, who died a couple of years ago and did horrible things again to children. He was one of the biggest charity givers, most magnanimous people and, and all of that. And I'm, I'm aware when you when you say the word virtue, everyone starts thinking about a left and right binary or left wing, whatever. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about people like this guy, really, really bad people who get away with, you know, pushing their whole virtue thing. They, they sort of hide behind that. Now, the reason I like talking to psychopaths is because it's clear from the beginning of the conversation 
that they are not virtuously like good they don't have good virtue they're not going to compete with that um when you find you're not good at a particular status it's a particular type of status so say you know you're not good at being dominant you might just opt out of that and actually devalue that as an interesting kind of status to, to hold i think i'm that way i like to think that i don't appear dominant and that means i look down on dominant people sometimes my brain tells me like oh what a stupid thing to care about but there are plenty of people who do care about that kind of status and they sort of compare their cars and their muscles and things like that mm -hmm. uh, and again this the status thing can be the same thing people start comparing themselves so i get to talk to a psychopath and they don't try to sort of i know that they're not going to try and pretend that they're better than they are and mm. that's rare because we all have to speak some sort of language and pretend that we're better than we are in some way and it's such a relief to sit down and talk to someone who's just like yeah i don't have that i don't care about that and you can get really honest answers about them and how they feel about life and that kind of thing and that fascinates me I definitely recommend that people uh, check those out because they are very candid and you mm. sort of say in them, uh, uh, I can't remember which one I was watching the other day, but you, I remember you sort of saying, I wouldn't be able to ask most people this, but you don't mind, do you? So, that's exactly it. And that's, it is very refreshing. Yeah. This has been amazing. Um, just digging in a little bit to your stuff. Definitely, definitely can't recommend your channel enough. Uh, On the Edge with Andrew Gold. Please do go and check him out, everybody. The other person that was good to interview is Amanda Knox, right? And she's not a psychopath oh, because yeah. I don't I don't think she killed anyone, but people think she did. But either way, this is the interesting thing with that theory. Because she knows she can never be known as like the media darling who is, you know, who's a, such a nice person, she's also somebody who I think discards the value of the virtue one. She's more likely to try mm. and be successful or to try and be uh, dominant, perhaps, because like no one's ever going to say, well done, Amanda, you're so nice, because everybody's fixated on the false belief that she killed someone, which is really sad. But she's also then incredibly candid. She's really open and she'll say things that are not in line with like cultural expectations of what she should say. Just opinions doesn't mean they're right or wrong, but it's just... I love talking to people like that where we don't have to be quite as as guarded, you know. It's been really lovely to talk to you. Yeah, oh, I'm. Uh, you too. I, I've got a few more few more videos on your channel to binge, so um, but I'm nearly there. <laughs> Get binge in. I love your channel as well. We love each other's channels. Yes. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for watching. Do go and check out Andrew's channel. I'm only half joking when I say it is genuinely really good. I wouldn't binge it if I didn't think it was genuinely good content. So. <laughs> You, uh, yeah, and leave some thoughts down below and leave a big thumbs up for Andrew. And uh, yeah, we'll see you very soon.